The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has denied any plan to increase the price of petrol. Addressing the news conference in Abuja, the Group General Manager, Public Affairs Division of the NNPC, Mr. Mohamed Grabadin, said there is absolutely no plan by the federal government or any NNPC subsidiary to increase fuel price above the 145 Naira level. In reference to a news report that the 145 Naira per litre is not sustainable, Mr. Garabedin explained that the statement was not taken in the right context. The bottom line, regardless of what was said, the bottom line is that there is absolutely no plans whatsoever uh, by government to increase fuel price above the 445 maximum level. If there is going to be anything like that, the agency responsible for the fixing price of petrol, the PPPRA, will definitely sensitize Nigerians and give reasons why. As, as, as of this moment, there is absolutely no plan to do that, and there is no need to do that. Because we have more than enough supply at the moment. We have a very robust uh, stock of uh, products in our custody. And uh, in addition to that, we also have long-term uh, procurement contracts with our suppliers. So the usual reason that will uh, necessitate any review of price at the moment, they have been well taken care of. The Niger Delta Avengers has blown up a pipeline in Wari's southwest local government area of Delta State. A source in the NNS Delta confirms that the attack, which was carried out at about 4 this morning, destroyed the Chevron Escravos export pipeline at Escravos offshore. There's been relative peace in the Niger Delta region for at least a few months, with different groups asking the federal government to dialogue with the militants. Here's Ibrahim Adra with more on the news at 10. He's in Abuja. Hi, Ibrahim. Hi, doing Amarachi. Conflicting accounts have continued to trail the killing of Nigerian footballer Joseph Izu, who was reportedly shot by the army in River State. The father and family members accused soldiers of shooting their son, a claim the army denies. In the special report, our correspondent Emmanuel Ray takes a trip to the community to speak to some eyewitnesses. Information available to the patrolling troops indicated the presence of suspects, suspected parties in Okariki village. The troops moved in and raided the suspected criminal hideout. Uh, one person lost his life at the hideout while several others fled. Later it was confirmed that the person who lost his life was a Nigerian footballer identified as Mr. Izu Joseph. The Commander 2 Brigade Nigerian Army, Brigadier General Amisu Azan, explaining the circumstances that led to the death of a Nigerian footballer, Joseph Izu. Following the tension generated by the incident, we took a trip to Okaki community, which sits on the boundary between rivers and Bielsa states by the bank of Orashi River. <laughs> The occupation of the people here is mainly farming and fishing. There is an easy calm in the air as we walk through the pathway to the alleged cultist shrine where the Nigerian footballer was reportedly shot. This area is popularly called ghetto in Okaki community in the west local government area of River States. And according to the army, this is a cultist shrine linked to the unfortunate death of the Nigerian footballer Joseph Izu. I ran inside the... This eyewitness narrates stories that seem to differ from the earlier one by the army. I was peeping towards the window and I saw this particular, uh, this particular guy. They shot, that the pillar, they shot him through his leg. He was screaming. I'm, I'm innocent, oh. I'm innocent. I'm a footballer. Oh. He brought his ID card and showed, and showed them. They now shed his ID card and it was confirmed that he's a footballer and that was how they shot him. Meanwhile, the suspected cultist claims he was present with the late footballer at the ghetto when the army stormed the area. When I went there, Izu itself was inside the, the ghetto. One of the guys stood up and said that they are, they are coming. 
So we now all fell into the water and Izu ran away too. And uh, when, I, when I saw that it was Nigerian army, so I now surrender. Our findings take us to his home in the community, found to be under lock and key with no one around. The next port of call is a home of the permanent ruler of the community. The visibly angry ruler speaks on the matter. I, as a person, have proclaimed, move around this community. I have destroyed that place. So it's unfortunate. Whoever might at fall victim, let him take it with good faith. According to the army, a formal report will be presented at the end of investigations. However, family and friends are hopeful that justice will prevail. Emmanuel Ire, Channels Television News. Still staying on the Niger Delta, some indigents of the area and other interested parties have proposed a restructuring of the presidential amnesty program to include state governments as partners. And the proposal was put forward at a public hearing organized by the House of Representatives on a bill seeking to give legal backing to the amnesty program. Our correspondent, Larry Lassisi, has this report. Well, the Traditional rulers, state and federal government officials at a public hearing on a bill before the House Committee on Niger Delta Affairs. The bill is titled the Presidential Program on Rehabilitation and Reintegration and it will be for the implementation of the Presidential Amnesty Program in the Niger Delta. The chairman of the House Committee and the Deputy Minority Leader speak on what the bill hopes to achieve. At the time the amnesty was implemented, there was no legal framework in place to guide the implementation of this program. This subjected the program to various abuses. There was no exit date, and such expensive program could not be carried carry on endlessly. One, to provide a legal and institutional framework for the implementation and management of the presidential amnesty program. Two, to consolidate the different phases of the program from inception. Three, to ensure an orderly completion of the mandate of the program with a proper exit date. Those present at the event made use of the occasion to identify different aspects of the bill they want amended. The tenure of the coordinator of the program should not be longer than the lifespan of the program being coordinated. A six-year, three-plus-three term may also be optimistic. What at the moment is solely run by the federal government? This needs to change. The state governments in the region need to be engaged as partners with the federal government. This is applicable in the US, in uh, Britain, in China, even in Nigeria, where we started. Even in South Africa, we are talking about. The programs are directly under the president because it is very important. The committee says it will consider all the positions presented as it works towards contributing to the peace process and the development of the Niger Delta region. Lanre Lassese, Channels Television News. The future of nations by the year 2030 may be determined by investment and support for 10-year-old girls today. That's according to the United Nations Population Fund. To this end, the UNFPA is asking Nigeria to invest in girl-child education to end issues of poverty and employment and attain the Sustainable Development Goals. Our correspondent Gloria Omezoke reports. Emerging stories including kidnapping gives a graphic sense of the enormous educational struggle faced by children, particularly girls, in many parts of the world. The emphasis on girls' education is paramount. The United Nations, in a continuous advocacy against early child marriage and child abuse across the globe, underlined the dangers of giving out girls early in marriage without giving them the necessary education or skills. In the north, it might be more prevalent, but the issue of the 10-year-old girl, regardless of where they are, it's across the board. It is in Nigeria, it's in sub-Saharan Africa. The same story repeats itself in Asia and the Pacific. I think the most important investment is investment in the education. It is said that education is the best investment that we could ever have. So ensuring that girls go to primary school and go to secondary school and to tertiary, have a tertiary education, but the very minimum secondary school. 
investing in their health, ensuring that they have access to the health services they need. Launching the State of World Population 2016 report with support from the government and key education organizations, the strategy aims to remove barriers that prevent girls from going to school, including issues of insecurity. The security issue is not only one aspect, it's a, co it's a collective issue. So every stakeholder must take part in that. So these children can be protected, you know, within even their own locality. We can raise a people to protect them in their own locality. So what we need is an encouragement on, on the part of the communities, you know, to be aware the importance of girl child education. Adeze Ezioke, who desires to work with the United Nations, appealed to the government to look into practices that harm girls, violate their human rights starting at age 10, and prevent them from contributing to the economic and social progress of their communities. Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television. Many thanks, Gloria. We'll get right back to Amarachi in Lagos for more reports on the news at 10. Amarachi. Thanks a lot, Ibrahim. A federal high court in Lagos has dismissed an application to bar journalists from covering and reporting the proceedings in the case of an alleged illegal oil export filed by the federal government against multinational oil company Total EMP Nigeria PLC. The federal government is contending that the oil company underdeclared the volume of crude oil it shipped out of the country between January 2011 and December 2014, and thereby shortchanging it to the tune of over $245 million. Total, through its lawyer, Mr. Babatunde Fabunlu, had filed an application urging the courts to bar journalists from covering the proceedings, arguing that the media reports were prejudging the case. But the judge dismissed the application, stating the journalists could not be barred from performing their duty in court, being a public place. The judge also granted an application by the federal government to amend its pleadings in the case before adjourning further proceedings in the case until January 16, 2017. Still ahead on the news at 10, House of Representatives uncovers multi-billionaire fraud between government MDAs and insurance companies. That's the business news. Please join us again.